warning. You are about to enter the memory hole, a region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it. Hey there, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, the show that reluctantly eats the plane crash victims of television past. Hip-hop today completely dominates the music business, but at one point, rap was a totally new thing that had to be explained to us by an old white man. The music that is all beat, strong beat, and talk, it's rap music. But there was one group that embraced rap music more than any other, professional football players. It started in 1985 when the Chicago Bears shocked the world with their rhythm and swagger in the Super Bowl shuffle. We're not here to start no trouble. We're just here to do the Super Bowl shuffle. Oh, but they did start trouble because that song spawned dozens of imitations, unleashing a plague of saxophone solos, awkward high fives, and people basically just saying what their names are and what they're here to say. The Seattle Seahawks released a homoerotic romp called Locker Room Rock while the Washington Redskins celebrated their non-Native American fans. The The L.A. Rams song, Ram It, was rammed so full of sexual innuendo that it nearly shattered their jock straps. Unfortunately, our lawyers said it was too vulgar and copyrighted to show you. So instead, here are the lyrics read to you by Game of Thrones actor John Bradley, a man of such gravitas that he completely removes any sleazy double meaning. I like to ram it, as you can see. Nobody loves ramming any more than me. I learned long ago to ram it just right. You can ram it all day or ram it all night. I come from the end looking for the sack and I don't stop coming until I put them on their back. I'm quick off the line as I can be because I don't want dick running over me. But enough about me. We're here to ram it, you see. And if you ram it just right, you can ram it all night. The greatest sports team music video of all time wasn't a rap song at all. It was a Springsteenian power ballad by a Canadian hockey team, the Calgary Flames, called Red Hot. The song was trying to be a classic rock anthem, but it ended up feeling like a karaoke night for divorced dads. That's a song you can crank up in your Camaro on your way to court to fight for custody. The performances are burning with such intensity, you almost don't notice that they definitely aren't playing those instruments, and they definitely are cutting each other's hair. The lyrics are meant to be inspirational, but they're really just a list of things you can do with wildly varying levels of difficulty. Very hard, especially with all that extra mustache weight. Easy, but dick move. Well, that's just being the British Empire. The research team here at Memory Hole uncovered a third verse of Red Hot that wasn't included in the original, probably because it was just too inspirational. And no one has ever seen or heard this verse until now. You can drive without a seat belt. You can cough in Oprah's space. You can almost win at checkers. You can kill a man in space. You can't touch a flame when it's red hot. You can't put the fire around like a magic thing that can't be bought. You can't touch a flame when it's red hot, red hot, red hot. Thanks for watching Memory Hole. See you next time. And remember to stay hot. Red hot.
Hi, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, a rummaging bear paw through the trash can of history. My home country of Canada regularly makes humbler versions of American TV shows. It's a tradition that goes back to the 1970s when we had our own version of The Tonight Show, Elwood Glover's Luncheon Date, which was so low budget that the host doubled as the sound guy. There was also Canada's Star Trek, The Star Lost, about a space colony infected by stock footage of bees. Canada even had its own Miami Vice, The Beachcombers, starring two stylish Canadian loggers who didn't hesitate to pull a gun when the action got hot. But the most successful American knockoff was Canada's Lassie, The Littlest Hobo, a show about a German shepherd who went from town to town solving people's problems, but within the limited skill set of dogs. So things like pulling on various ropes, honking horns, opening doors, pushing boxes on the bad guys, spying, DJing, driving bulldozers, delivering babies, and convincing Daphne's fiance from Fraser to quit smoking. Right. I'll quit. You know, regular dog stuff. When I was a kid, I loved this show. And that dog, god damn, that's a beautiful dog. I mean, it's not just me, right? Wow, what a beautiful dog. Hey, that's a fine looking animal. He's a beauty, all right. Handsome animal. You're a really good looking dog. I know, it's an attractive dog. Now that's an animal. So you're a good looking dog. You mind if I take your picture? You're very handsome. Would you like to be my beau? Wait, do they want to f the dog? Oh, yeah, they're totally f This was an incredibly successful show. They made 114 episodes, so many that the writers eventually ran out of stories that were plausible for a dog to solve, or even plausible for the 20th century. We have reason to believe the man has the plague. He's got the plague. But my favorite episode is an early one called Boy on Wheels, the first on-camera appearance by Canada's Mike Myers, a comedy legend which makes it surprising that this scene contains no humor, intentional or otherwise. None. There is nothing funny about this scene. Hey, Chris, where'd you get the dog? I never saw him before. He's a real frisbee hound. Oh, gee, thanks. You'll notice I'm not laughing because, again, nothing about that was funny. There's one more moment of this episode I have to show you, but first, Let's remember that the littlest hobo is an actual dog, and sometimes dogs don't want to do everything the script calls for, like swim through rapids, or jump through a glass window, or jump off a freighter, or jump out of a plane. Good luck, Smoke. That up. The worst example of non-consensual heroics came when Hobo intercepts the boy on wheels to save him from an oncoming truck. I can't prove it, but I am 99% sure that they threw that dog. They threw the dog from off camera into a wheelchair. So let's just take a moment to walk through the sequence of events that probably led to that decision. The director was like, okay, this is the part where the dog tackles the kid in the wheelchair. But the dog trainer was like, the dog won't do that. So the director flipped out, kicked over his chair and screamed, this is the emotional climax of the episode, and I will not compromise my artistic vision for some f***ing dog. Meanwhile, the wheelchair kid is just waiting to be done so he can go home and play Atari. Then the director says, let's just throw the dog. But the trainer is like, no way. But then he remembered, there's not many dog gigs in Canadian TV. So the trainer gave in. They picked up the dog, and they heaved it into the boy. Don't worry, the dog and the boy were okay. Probably. Honestly, I don't know. I mean, the dog is definitely dead by now. See you next time. A region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it. Hi there, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, where we take the moments that time forgot 
and make you want to re-forget them. Today's stadium shows are mind-blowing spectacles with precisely choreographed camera angles and expert pyrotechnics. But 30 years ago, they were all stadium-sized trash heaps. The 1989 Super Bowl halftime show was basically a children's birthday party with a slightly bigger budget. A 50s-themed magic show starring a magician named Elvis Presto. It combined the two most well-respected American art forms, stage magic and Elvis impersonation, and had all the glamour and excitement of a 24-hour Applebee's. The real magic happened a few years later in the World Cup opening ceremony, when Diana Ross showed off her versatility by simultaneously singing, running towards a ball, and missing a kick so embarrassingly that the goal fell apart in shame. But the worst televised stadium show was one that celebrated the stadium itself. Sky Dome, which opened in 1989 in my home country of Canada, it was the first multi-purpose, state-of-the-art dome stadium with a fully retractable roof, making all those multi-purpose, state-of-the-art dome stadiums with partially retractable roofs look like real dumpy pieces of shit. But while Sky Dome was a marvel of engineering, its television debut was a marvel unto itself, called The Opening of Sky Dome. A celebration. A production so spectacularly bad, it has to be endured to be believed. It featured Canada's biggest stars, from Dave Thomas to David Clayton Thomas, and was hosted by the late Alan Thicke, father of horny Beetlejuice Robin Thicke. His co-host was SCTV's Andrea Martin, presumably doing this in exchange for the safety of her loved ones. The show was clearly inspired by Broadway musicals, But since it was performed at the bottom of a giant cement cavern, it felt more like a North Korean nuclear jubilee. Things kicked off with an opening number dominated by architectural specifics. The world's largest retractable ceiling, multi-purpose, eight acre, 30 story. But they did finally get to the point. Have you ever cringed so hard you could feel your DNA strands unraveling? In case the whole retractable dome thing still hadn't sunk in, it was reiterated in a series of sports-themed show tunes sung by people who, and you'll have to trust me on this, weren't actual professional athletes. There's more. Marriage of Figaro, La Traviata. More. Unfortunately, the producers of the Sky Dome celebration put so much focus on the dome that they forgot about the sky. Behind me, they are announcing that the roof will be closed, and I'm sure you'll hear the boos. Apparently, there is a lightning storm in the area. But Sky Dome president Chuck Magwood declared his celebration unsinkable and opened the dome in spite of a torrential downpour, forcing performers to put both their dignity and safety at risk. As a final insult to anyone who hadn't left yet, the closing number was about how fantastically dry Skydome would keep its audience. We don't care if it rains or pours when you see me come the better open that The show eventually, mercifully, came to an end with Alan Thicke's cheese dick charm persevering. Sky Dome is a reality. The sky's the limit here. And when it was all over, there was only one job left to do, as explained by this local reporter and his full head of totally legitimate hair. Opening night is history, of course, and now that the hoopla and the fanfare has died down, there's just one job left to do. Glenn Cochran, CFTO News. Thanks for watching Memory Hole. See you next time. Shouldn't there be another guy who does this? Are these all eyelashes? What happened in here? You are about to enter the memory hole, a region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it.
Hey there, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, where we find videos that make you say, what the f and we tell you exactly how the f If there's one thing every parent today can agree on, it's that children are idiots, and we need to protect them from accidentally killing themselves. That's always been true, and it's why public service announcements, or PSAs, were created to educate kids about common dangers, like smoking, downhill tractor driving, and pay TV. By the 1980s, PSA zeroed in on two major issues, drugs and sex. The anti-drug message was clear and to the point. Drugs will kill you, but my God, you'll have a great time before they do. When my home country of Canada wanted to warn kids off drugs, they brought out our most respected citizens, hockey players. They say that drugs get you high. Well, I get high on playing hockey. Getting high on hockey is what Canadians call concussions. Another Canadian PSA kept kids safe from drugs with this song. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you stuff it in your face. Don't stuff it in your face. The big budget anti-drug ads came from America, and none were bigger than cartoon all-stars to the rescue. It's... it's me. This is my future. It is if you don't get off those drugs. It premiered in 1990 during America's War on Drugs when President Bush went on live television to show how easy it was to buy crack from his son's friends. The president felt so strongly, he personally introduced this PSA. Drugs and alcohol can ruin your life. Although they are handy for funding your covert wars in Central America, even if adults managed to keep kids away from drugs, there was another, even graver danger lurking nearby. Sex, sex, teenager, sex, depraved teenager, sex, jungle. No PSA tackled sex education with more passion or hairspray than a pro-abstinence PSA hosted by Jason and Justine Bateman. Just a normal brother and sister helping teens not get laid in perfect harmony. How can I How tell, can I tell if, if I'm really in love? Nailed it. The PSA is all about love, which is a confusing topic for teens and apparently for Justine. I say to my boyfriend, I'm in love with you. But still, I'm saying so many things. You know, I know what I'm saying, but I don't. You follow? What is love? Now that's a tough question. So for an answer, she went to the experts, teenagers. Love. <laughs> it's like a white light. You know, it's not, there's no darkness in it. It's just pure white. I don't think you have to be in love to feel alive. But to feel alive, you have to be in love. Love is the ultimate fulfillment. And when you're totally fulfilled, it's as if you're on the planet Z of funness. In the middle of all this teens planning is one anecdote that belonged in a very different PSA. It was love at first sight, but I was only 10 and he was 17. Let's hear her out. I guess I passed out or something. Uh-huh. But when I woke up, he was carrying me out of the water. And that's when I fell in love. What a beautiful love story slash police testimonial, huh? The awkward tension of that moment was broken up by the sudden appearance of Ted Danson, looking like an experienced lover who's also a virgin at sitting in chairs. Listen, we're, we're all sexual, but there are lots of ways to show somebody who loved them. I like to think that Ted Danson starts every sentence with, listen, we're all sexual. The brilliance of how can I tell if I'm really in love is that it combined three things guaranteed to get teens' attention. Bateman's, Danson's, and acronyms, or BDAs. Oh, he was so T M, yeah, he was so T S, and he wondered if she was G I B. He said I'm H T T, and my fantasy is to be I T B of my L T D. J Fing C. By the end, viewers were left with more questions than answers. Questions like, should we raise the voting age to 30? Did this count towards Ted Danson's community service? It did, and most importantly. How does Jason Bateman feel about this now? Thanks, Will. Starring in a PSA might seem like a lot of fun. Maybe all your friends are doing it, even your sister. But gang, it's important to remember that these things don't just go away. They live on the internet forever. So if someone you love is starring in a PSA or even thinking about trying one, tell them to just say no to anything less than six figures. <laughs> That's one to grow on. I hope you enjoyed that. He cost half our budget.
Thanks for watching Memory Hole. See you next time. to the memory hole, a region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it. Hi there, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, a show that takes history's unwanted children and raises them as our own. MMA is the fastest growing sport in America, but its roots stretch all the way back to the ancient 1980s, when Americans fell in love with the grace, beauty, and mystique of the martial arts. My favorite karate move is gun. There is actually more to that clip. One more. And then two more. <laughs> Karate movies sparked an interest in every kind of martial art, from Kung Fu to Shorin Ryu to Jiu Jitsu. And if you notice that those rhyme, you're not alone. I've done the Kung Fu, the Shorin Ryu. I even did a little Jiu Jitsu. Karate. Train your body. The Karate craze launched several careers, from Native American bear transformer Chuck Norris to crotch ruiner Jean-Claude Van Damme. Canada only had a single martial arts movie, Fearless Tiger, a story about a disc that contains the secret formula for how to be a convincing actor. Where's the disc? What are you guys doing here? Where's the disc? Hush up. Here's the disc. Send it over first. First the disc. Fearless Tiger was a shockingly bad karate movie. But shockingly, it wasn't the worst. Because the goddamn Americans beat us to last place with Gymkata. Gymkata took the athleticism of gymnastics and fused it with karate. A deadly combination when in the immediate vicinity of gym equipment. Jim Carter was the big screen debut and finale of Kurt Thomas, a world champion gymnast who had never acted before in his life, and arguably, he still hasn't. Because for most of the movie, he looked like he was trying not to look directly into the camera. It was a bizarre casting choice, but it was also the 1980s. There were six police academy movies, you could smoke on airplanes, they got a lot wrong. Like every other karate movie, Jim Carter started with a training montage where our hero, John, successfully undergoes a gauntlet of the most unflattering camera angles imaginable. But the celebration didn't last long because this guy who's about to get shot with an arrow gets shot with an arrow. I think... So John chases down the bad guys and unleashes the full fury of Jim Cotta, kicking ass and backflipping ass and cartwheeling ass. It culminates in a final battle in which John faces down an entire village of bloodthirsty savages with nothing to defend himself but his fist, his courage, and a pommel horse that happens to be there for some reason. Jim Cotta might have the most impossibly dumb plot in the history of film, and yet a studio executive gave it a green light. How did that happen? Here's the plot. Kurt Thomas plays Jonathan Cabot. He gets recruited by the American SIA, that's the Special Intelligence Agency, for a mission that can only be completed by someone with an expertise in violent gymnastics. The mission is for him to infiltrate the country of Parmistan. And Parmistan is the perfect place to put a satellite monitoring station which could help to detect and prevent an early nuclear attack. Now, the problem is, U.S. military powerless against Parmistan. Their one hope of infiltration is for Jonathan to play the game, a deadly gymnastics obstacle course, which is compulsory for all foreign visitors to Parmistan and which has claimed the lives of everyone who's ever attempted it for the last 900 years. If Jonathan can survive the game, Parmistan will grant him one wish, and the SAA wants a satellite monitoring station for America.
That writer's reputation died so that our show could live. God bless. Thanks for watching Memory Hole. See you next time. to the memory hole, a region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it. Hi there, I'm Will Arnett and this is Memory Hole, a deep dive into the shallow end of history's pool. These days, everyone has the internet and within seconds from the comfort of your own home, you can watch BoJack Horseman or porn or BoJack Horseman-themed porn. But there was a time when the internet was brand new, and it baffled even our wisest morning show hosts. What, do you write to it like mail? Allison, can you explain what internet is? It was a more innocent time when horny teen boys spent hours watching R-rated JPEGs load pixel by pixel. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. Oh, I'll bet. You're not fooling anyone, kid. As a parent, I've never been happier than when my children ask their friends over for an internet computer party. Okay, you're fooling one person. By the mid-90s, the internet had become a part of pop culture, and there was a boom in extremely realistic depictions of hacking on the big screen. Do it. Do it. The virus is in. The internet truly went mainstream with the arrival of the Windows 95 operating system, which launched with a massive marketing campaign. Microsoft executives were so excited about the new software that they got on stage and danced like they were at a pep rally for virginity. The centerpiece of the Windows 95 launch was an instructional guide starring Jennifer Aniston and my fellow Canadian, Matthew Perry. And no, Canadians don't all know each other. But Matt and I do know each other. Back in 1995, Jen and Matt were on the world's most popular sitcom, Friends, a show about 20-somethings in New York who could somehow afford huge apartments, but not clothes that fit them. Microsoft decided to piggyback off the success of Friends by making a cyber sitcom that featured one-third of its cast and no third of its jokes. Oh, gosh, who's that? I don't know, but uh, could he be any larger? It's Boris, the window washer. My God, Mm -hmm. he is a large, large man. That man must be on a plank of steel. Jokes about overweight people are one of those things from the 90s that didn't age well, like Space Jam and Bill Maher. The story of the cyber sitcom begins when Jennifer feels hungry, so the gang decide to order Chinese food by fax. Why don't you fax it on through to the restaurant? You can fax through a computer. Amazing, right, Jen? Program menu, accessories, fax, compose new fax. If Matthew Perry reading instructions out loud like your dad changing his iPhone settings didn't hold your interest, there was also a subplot about a mysterious button. Okay, now what's that button? Don't touch that. Whatever you do, stay away from that button. Or you'll go blind. Worse, way worse. You'll star in a humiliating Windows 95 instructional video that features a racist depiction of a Chinese food delivery person. I guess you are here for some Windows 95 interface therapy. You may have noticed that actor is white, but to be fair, Chinese people wouldn't be invented for another three years. The final act featured a brand new character slash stereotype, Joystick Johnny. It's Joystick Johnny. A video game addict who combined modern gamer sexism with old timey slang. A girl. Hardy har har. <laughs> Jennifer challenges him to a game of 3D pinball, also known as pinball, beats him, and then celebrates her win by pressing the forbidden button, imprisoning Joystick Johnny and the rest of the cast inside the computer indefinitely. Oh, wow. What do we do? <sighs> Leave. Manny, what's going on? Those monsters just left them there to rot forever and no one ever heard from them again. Everyone's 
Chinese food that we maxed out for? I, I'm literally starving. What? No. No, 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 come back. Please come back. Thanks for watching Memory Hole. See you next time. Warning. You are about to enter the Memory Hole, a region of pop culture history so painful that no light can escape it. Hey there, I'm Will Arnett, and this is Memory Hole, where we take videos that seemed like a good idea at the time and put them in a show that seems like a good idea at this time. To lose weight these days, we get high-tech help from workout apps, Peloton, and Instagram-fueled shame. But back in the 80s, the only technology people needed were VHS tapes. They were like YouTube, but you had to rewind them, and they didn't gradually turn you into a neo-Nazi. VCRs around the world pumped out years of jazzercising, groin flexing, air humping, and prolific use of the term buns. In 1982, Jane Fonda's self-titled workout video became the highest selling VHS of all time. And soon, every B to D level celebrity was cashing in on their fading brand with an exercise video. From professional hunk Fabio to aspiring Asian David Carradine. Designing Women's Dixie Carter released what was either a fitness video or her audition tape for The Shining. <laughs> She's clearly working out something. O.J. Simpson recorded a fitness video a few weeks before his ex-wife was murdered by, who knows? Could have been anyone. Yeah, I'm telling you, you gotta get your space in if you're working out with the wife, if you know what I mean. Oh, we know what you mean. Professional lecturer Alyssa Milano's VHS was called Teen Steam, which sounds like a category on Pornhub. She was 15 at the time, which means the director of this video is definitely guilty of statutory cinematography. Instead of jail bait, many celebrity fitness videos featured coffin bait. Senior citizens could shuffle along with their favorite Hollywood relic as they made depressing jokes about their decaying bodies or sexually harassed their trainers. This is my trainer, Debbie White. Not bad, huh? Wonderful, guys. You really are solid here. I like it. Go get them, Tiger. Ooh. Angela Lansbury used her exercise video to take viewers on a sensual journey from head to camel toe, finishing off with an episode of Murder, She Rubbed. I believe it's important for a woman to try and maintain a certain sense of mystery about herself. When I was growing up in Canada, there wasn't a single homegrown celebrity workout tape. We had to make do with our best Canadians hosting American fitness shows. And they didn't come more Canadian or more hosty than Alan Thicke. That's right, he's back. Canada's serial face molester emceed the 1988 National Aerobics Championships, an hour-long pageant of cardio addicts dancing around like they just won the lottery and the jackpot was a brick of meth. Alan Thicke didn't just host the event, he performed his own original aerobics-themed song, Sweaty and Hot, surrounded by a flurry of gyrating spandex. You're gonna take me to hell. Audiences clapped their hands raw as Alan belted out lyrics about how horny he was for fitness. That man had a passion for health. The National Aerobics Championship was a grinning rampage of flailing, sweaty limbs, which sometimes felt like a competition to see who could mock quadriplegics in the cruelest way possible. Contestants were judged on their creative presentation of push-ups, high kicks, sit-ups, jumping jacks, and revealing whether or not they were He started taking classes from me, and now uh, I worked his tail off. I shouldn't say that on TV. Yeah. <laughs> it's like working with my own sister. I feel like my own family, having a lot of fun. While the whole competition was incredible, the most captivating parts were the introductions, which might be the perfect representation of how women experience dating apps. Representing the Vertical Club in New York City, Joshua Askew. From Flatiron Athletic Club in Boulder, Greg Corelli. From the Maricopa Athletic Club in Phoenix, Peter Dale. In the 1980s, that was basically a dick pic. 
There may not have been a demand for a Canadian celebrity workout tape in the past, but times have changed. We now see Canadians as actual people, people deserving of their own workout video. So I made one myself. I'm Will Arnett, but for the next hour, I'm going to get you Canucks sorted out good. So strap your Nikes on and head to the gym, eh? And let's take that body out for a rep. Jesus, Murphy, pick up the pace. If you don't have weight, just use a couple of bags of milk. Yeah, I met Alan Thick one time, eh? Good guy. Normal like you and me. Hey, I'm going to go out and kill a dart. You just keep giving her, eh? That's it for this season of Memory Hole, which proves once and for all that when it comes to awful television, Canada deserves your respect. We made a lot of fantastic crap. And a special shout out to Alan Thick, RIP. Thanks for keeping it thick. Oh,